This video is part of the Sharing Your Research Workshop series for graduate students and early career researchers. Some examples will be targeted toward this group, but overall this video will provide a good general introduction to copyright in your rights as an author in regards to academic publishing. A quick disclaimer, this presentation is not legal advice and is not intended to replace the advice of legal counsel. To start, let me introduce myself. My name is Chelsea Boley and I'm the Scholar Communication Librarian at Texas Women's University. I'm here as a resource and collaborator for the TWU community. I provide education and training on open access and publishing, copyright consultations, and can help you with finding an open access journal or drafting a data management plan. If you're a student, faculty, or staff member of TWU, please do contact me with any questions regarding academic publishing, open access, copyright, and data management plans. This talk and slides are licensed CC BY, which means you are permitted to reuse and remix this presentation as long as you provide me credit. What is copyright? Copyright is a form of legal protection that provides the authors with limited control over the production and distribution of their work. The types of works protected by copyright include literary, musical, dramatic, graphic, sculptural, and choreographic works. Within your copyright, there are five standard rights. The right to reproduce copies, make derivative works, distribute copies, and perform or display the work publicly. As a graduate student, you are probably concerned primarily with how you can legally use copyrighted works in your research, and how to protect your own rights as an author. As a rule of thumb, works registered or published in the United States before 1923 are in the public domain. You're able to freely use these works without restriction, but things get a bit trickier for works published after 1923. Here's a good rule of thumb chart created by Kenneth Cruz to help you determine what the copyright status of a work is. For example, if a work was created in or after 1978, it's protected for the life of the author plus 70 years. Depending on your subject area, this category may be where the largest amount of your research sources will be. This applies to your own work as well. Let's say you are a 30-year-old PhD student and you live to the age of 100. Your PhD dissertation will be protected under copyright law until the year 2156. Fair use is a right within copyright law that permits the limited use of a copyrighted work without permission, but fair use is complicated. Let's take a look at a wonderful video created by Texas A&M University Libraries about how fair use is complicated. What is fair use? Fair use is an exception which permits limited use of copyrighted materials without needing permission from the creator of the works. The government uses many factors to determine fair use. Is it meant for creative expression? How much is being used? And what is the quality of the work? Is it being used for commercial gain? All these questions and more need to be answered. Basically, it can get complicated. So what does that mean? And how are scholars and institutions supposed to interpret these rules in a way that benefits learning? At Texas A&M University Libraries, we think of fair use like a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. Some people are so afraid of breaking the law that they use it very little or almost not at all. Others use it too much and think that no one will notice if they are bending the rules, since the rules aren't clearly defined. This means many people aren't using it equally, mainly because the definition can be quite vague. Even though countless lawyers and millions of dollars have been used to try to define what qualifies as fair use, the definition is purposefully open to interpretation. The four factors of fair use are the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market. There are a lot of misconceptions about fair use. One I've heard from many students is that if you aren't making money off of it, then you're okay. It's fair use and you're not infringing. This isn't true. Keep in mind all four factors. What you should ask yourself is about the purpose. Is the use transformative? Are you adding something new with a different character, meaning, or function? Some examples of fair use include quoting and reporting the news, making books accessible to the blind and print disabled, and creating parodies to make fun of culture. You've probably noticed plenty of the song parodies that are all over YouTube. Those are excellent examples of what fair use is. Fair use is an important right within copyright law, but when in doubt or wanting to use a copyrighted work in your research beyond citations and short quotations, it is always best to get permission. Some materials you may need to get permission for are long quotes, unpublished materials, poetry, music lyrics, and graphic works. Kenneth Cruz once again helps us out with a sample request form. 
This sample request form could be used by you to gain permission from an author to use their work in your research. The link to this sample request and other resources is listed below this video when viewing on YouTube. Under United States law, works are protected by copyright automatically at the time of creation. You are not required to put a copyright notice on the work, register the work with the U.S. Copyright Office, or to publish the work. Although a copyright notice isn't required by law, it can be a good idea to include it if you're making a work publicly available. The biggest takeaway I want you to gain from this workshop video is that you own what you create. Your copyright is automatic and you have the full rights to your work unless you give it away. Unfortunately, academic authors give away so much of their work to publishers through copyright transfer agreements. A standard practice in academic journals is a full transfer copyright despite the fact that publishers only legally need a license to publish. For example, I recently received a question from a nursing faculty member about the copyright agreement for the Journal of Continuing Education and Nursing. The publisher of this journal is Slack, who is among the most restrictive of publishers when it comes to copyright transfer agreements. We'll go over a more common agreement from the publisher Wiley in a minute, but I want to provide the Slack agreement as an example of how restrictive some publishing agreements can be. This agreement requires a full transfer copyright from the author to the publisher. This agreement would not allow you to post a preprint or your submitted version of the article to a repository, post any version of the article to your own website, or for you to reuse any portion of your work without permission from the publisher if you wanted to use it in a collection. Let's overview a common copyright transfer agreement together. This agreement is from the publisher Wiley Blackwell, and it is similar to other publishing agreements you will see. If you are a student, this is likely the first time you have seen a publishing agreement. Even well-established faculty members don't always read these agreements closely and sign it quickly because they are pressed for time or feel pressured to agree in order to be published. Even if you choose to sign the agreement and not negotiate, please do read these agreements so that you are aware of what your rights are as an author after you enter into the agreement. The agreement starts out simply with a fill-in-the-blank section to identify the work that is being transferred. Below is where the agreement is spelled out. In section 1, the author assigns a full copyright to Wiley Blackwell. The publisher is requiring a full transfer, but this does permit some uses in the future. There are three versions of an article. The submitted version, also commonly called the preprint, the accepted version, also known as the postprint, and the final published version that is sometimes referred to as the publisher's PDF. For the submitted version of the article, the author can archive the version on their website or university's institutional repository and is permitted to share copies with colleagues. However, for the accepted version, you'll need to have a separate agreement with Wiley Blackwell. This accepted version is the peer-reviewed version prior to the publisher's contribution of typesetting. Other publishers often will allow you to share the accepted version on your personal website or institutional repository, but sometimes this sharing is embargoed for a period of time, such as 12 months. If your work is funded by a federal funding body, such as the National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health, the publisher will likely agree to permit archiving the accepted version after 12 months in order to comply with federal funding requirements. As you can see on this form, it is noted that if you're funded by the NIH, there is a box for you to check at the bottom in order to meet this requirement. If you have any questions about federal funding requirements, please do contact me. For the final published version, Wiley Blackwell allows you to share copies individually with colleagues, provide some options for reuse in future publications that are not in journals, in teaching duties, and in oral presentations. Let's take a look at Section 3C, Teaching Duties. The agreement states, Contribution, your article, may not be used in seminars outside of normal teaching obligations. Electronic posting of the final published version in connection with teaching or training at the contributor's institution or place of employment is permitted subject to the implementation of a reasonable access control mechanisms, such as a username and password. I want to point this sentence out because just because this is your journal article, you may not actually be able to use it as freely as you think you might be able to in your own classroom teaching. You would be able to use it on your individual class's Blackboard site but not put it on a publicly viewable website for your class. This can be frustrating because it's your own work. Again, you own what you create until you give away that right. 
Since these publishing agreements often require a full transfer of copyright, you actually might be infringing on the copyright of your own work that is now held by the publisher. Please do read your publishing agreements, ask questions, and negotiate if you want to retain further rights. If you're publishing in a journal and receive a copyright transfer agreement and aren't sure what you're signing, let's have a chat. I can help you understand what you can and cannot do after signing that agreement or potentially provide guidance when negotiating your agreement. As an author wanting to publish in an academic journal, you typically have three options in an agreement. Option one, you retain all rights in licensed publication. Option two, you transfer your copyright but retain some specified rights. This is the most common type of agreement. And option three, transfer a full copyright to the publisher and do not retain any specified rights. We definitely want to avoid you having to take option three. Option two will be the most likely scenario and perhaps you could negotiate the agreement further to retain more rights. We definitely want to avoid you having to take option three. Option two will be the most likely scenario and perhaps you could negotiate the agreement to retain more rights or a shorter term before you are permitted to archive your work. The best case scenario though is option one. This type of publishing agreement where you retain your copyright and license a publication is most commonly found in open access journals. If you would like to learn more about open access journals, check out the first video in this workshop series called Introduction to Open Access. The video is listed at the end of this presentation. Overviewing these publishing agreements may sound bleak, but remember that it doesn't have to be all or nothing with your publication agreements. You can negotiate your agreements. One great resource is the Spark Author Addendum, which will help you negotiate more retention of your rights. I've listed the link to the author addendum in this slide, but we'll also include it within the resources list below the video on YouTube. In addition to the Spark author addendum, you can create your own addendum at scholars.sciencecommons.org. This resource can be used by all research disciplines to develop an author addendum specific to what rights you want to retain. Think about, how do I want my research to be shared? Research is meant to be shared. By negotiating agreements, you can share your research more easily. Or if you choose an open access journal, you can share your research more widely and typically retain full copyright. You may also want to consider using a Creative Commons license. Creative Commons licenses allow authors to retain their copyright but communicate to others how their work can be used. Many open access publications utilize a variety of licenses or allow the author to choose what is best for them. For example, are you fine with someone using your work for any purpose? classroom teaching, translation, sharing online, but don't want them to be able to use it commercially? A CC BY NC license is right for you. Perhaps you're fine with your research being copied, distributed, and shared, but don't want it to be translated or used for commercial purposes. Then CC BY ND is the right license for you. To learn more about Creative Commons licenses, visit creativecommons.org. I just provided you with a lot of information on copyright, fair use, publishing agreements, and Creative Commons licenses. Remember, when you get confused or have a question, phone for help. I'd be happy to discuss your options or answer questions you have for any TWU faculty, student, or staff member. For further information, visit TWU's Library Guides or Sparks Authors Rights website. And once again, if you have a question, get in touch. Thank you for listening. There are three more videos in the Sharing Your Research workshop series, Intro to Open Access, Measuring Impact, and Research Data Management. If you're interested in copyright law more generally, the crash course video may be useful for you as well.